So I'd like to introduce our, our first speaker uh, to kick us off. Um, we have a talk called Interactive Visualization and Near Real-Time Analysis on Out-of-Core uh, Satellite Images. Uh, this talk is by Draga Dansila Pop. Draga is a recent graduate from Monash University with a Bachelor of Computer Science. Her areas of interest lie at the intersection of computer science and its applications to research in a variety of disciplines. So far, her research work has focused on microimaging and remote sensing image visualization and analysis. She is particularly passionate about open source software development and open research. She's currently teaching computer science and working part-time as a contractor on Napari, an open source n-dimensional image visualizer. So I'd like us all to welcome Draga. Uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself uh, and let us uh, let us go with the first talk of the day. I'm very excited. Sure. So hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully we don't have any uh, exciting things happening. Can everyone see that slide? Yes, we can. Looking good. Awesome. All right. So as Genevieve mentioned, this talk is going to be on interactive visualization of bigger than RAM uh, satellite images with Napari. Uh, Genevieve's already done a better job than I could have of introducing myself, uh, but I'm Draga. Uh, I'm a computer science graduate at Monash University. I first started working with Sentinel satellite images as a novel case study for Napari um, and during my honors year. And at the moment I am teaching and also contracting part-time on Napari. Uh, so what is Napari? So as uh, Genevieve mentioned, Napari is an n-dimensional image viewer offering both 2D and 3D rendering. Uh, with sliders added for additional dimensions, and we'll see an example of that in a moment. Uh, it's pure Python, so it allows for easy integration with the existing scientific analysis libraries. Uh, it's fully open source and it's very community driven. So if you're interested in contributing, maybe come along to some of our weekly community meetings. Uh, we have them suiting most time zones and, and we'd love to have you there. Um, so what does it mean for Napari to be n-dimensional? Uh, we're gonna play an example now, just to show you, this is going to be using publicly available data uh, from the cell tracking challenge. So we've got some TIFFs at a root path. This is an IPython shell. We're going to import Napari, and we're going to import imread from Dask image library. And then we're going to use that imread function to bring the TIFFs at that root path into a variable. And as we can see inside that variable now, we've got our Dask array. We're going to kick off a Napari viewer, just launching it uh, with that line there, viewing with people's Napari viewer. And now we're going to directly add that Dask array as an image uh, into our viewer. And as we can see, we've got the layer in there uh, named embryo. We can slide through the slices of the volume. And we can also, with that additional slider, slide through time. Uh, and we can see those little uh, ovarian embryos clicking along. And we can also uh, change the viewing mode to 3D rendering. And if we do, we can pan around it as you would expect for a 3D volume, but we've still got that additional slider uh, for time. And Napari will add additional sliders for you for as many dimensions as you have. Another aspect of Napari I wanna introduce is the different layer types. So we're gonna see an example with labels, but Napari also supports uh, shapes, tracks, points and surfaces uh, at the moment. And that makes it easy to seamlessly integrate your analysis results with the raw data uh, that you're performing your analysis on. And in the following example, we're going to be using the cells 3D uh, sample data from scikit image. So again, we're in an IPython shell, we're importing Napari. And then from scikit image, we're going to import a thresholding function and a labeling function because we're going to do a very quick and dirty uh, segmentation example here. Once we've got those imported, we're going to launch the Napari viewer again and then using one of the convenience methods for sample data, um, which is a viewer.open sample, we're going to get two layers back from opening the sample from scikit image. So we're just going to pass the um, repository that we're downloading from and the sample that we want. And as we can see, that adds the two layers to Napari and it returns them back to us as well. Uh, and we're going to just pull the data out of that layer object. And as we scroll through, we can see with this convenience function, we've got the color maps uh, and everything set as well. And now that we've got that cell data um, in the cell nuclei variable, we're going to a threshold. 
And then we're going to create a binarized image uh, using that threshold. Once we've got the binarized image, we can use the uh, scikit image measure label function to get a segmented uh, image with integer labels. And we can directly add those labels to the viewer. And we're going to make the blending translucent just so that we can still see the data underneath. Uh, and now that we've got that layer in the viewer, as we scroll through, we can see the results of the segmentation. Uh, and it's actually done a pretty good job for just this quick sort of 20 second example. And we can pan around that in 3D as well. So the next aspect of Napari I wanna talk about is like a little bit like me, Napari is lazy by nature. So if it's given a stack of images or a 3D volume, it will do its best to load just what's displayed on screen uh, wherever possible. So let's take another look at the data from the cell tracking challenge. Uh, but this time we're going to see how Napari handles it natively. So we're going to launch Napari this time just from the command line. And if we look inside this folder, we see we've got all of these TIFFs uh, corresponding to the different time points of uh, the acquisition. And now if we drag that folder in without doing any sort of dask image reading um, on the side, if we inspect the data of that layer, we can see that it actually already is a stacked dask array. So Napari is uh, implicitly going to take the folder and turn it into a dask array before it loads it. And we still got that very smooth scrolling without compromising uh, the amount of memory being used. And the final aspect of Napari I wanna talk about before we start talking about the satellite images, I promised, is how extensible it is through plugins. So we're going to see two examples of reader plugins, which allow you to open custom file types in Napari but later we're going to see some GUI examples as well. And for these examples, we're using images of platelets swarming towards a blood clot in a live mouse. And that's provided by Pia Larson from Monash University. And then the other example is mouse blastocysts and that's publicly available uh, at the image data resource at openmicroscopy.org. So we're looking at our file system and we've got this ZAR. It's a multi-scale ZAR and so Napari can't open that natively. But if we install the OME ZAR package, which provides a reader for Napari, we're then able to launch Napari, give it the path to that multi-scale ZAR, and Napari will open that for us using that OME ZAR reader. And as we can see, we've got the channels and they're nicely named because of the metadata included in the OME ZAR, and we can scroll through that very smoothly. We've got the color map set and everything, no worries. In this next example, we're going to try and open an ND2 image. And as we can see natively, Napari can't do that. It says, hey, there's no plugin available. Using the GUI installer this time, we're going to install the ND2 Dask package, which is one of the libraries providing an ND2 reader. And if we scroll, we can see that that's now been added to our installed plugins. And now we're able to simply drag in the ND2 file. And pretty quickly, it opens up with all the different layers. We can look at it in 3D. And if we go through further in time, we can see that those platelets are swarming uh, towards that blood clot. So I mentioned satellite images, but haven't really shown you any. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. So I first started working with these satellite images uh, to provide an interactive system for researchers working on a land cover study of Victoria. And they were using Sentinel images to produce the Monash veg map, um, as they called it which is this website where you can go, you can see the satellite uh, image on the left and on the right, you can see the classification, the land cover classification of each pixel as well as a legend. Um, and the researchers working with these images were having a fair bit of difficulty viewing their data sets, first of all, just over time. So they weren't really able to load multiple time points and then scroll through them. They were only able to load maybe one time point or just a part of a, of a slice. And they also had trouble just comparing the different visualizations. Um, so for example, these labels, they had difficulty overlaying those onto the raw data that they came from in order to validate their results. Uh, so let's take a look at their workflow as it stood when we came in. So the first part of their workflow was just downloading the images. Uh, and they were downloaded from PEPS, which is a French platform that provides open access to the Sentinel images. Um, and the result of the download was this folder for each uh, military grid reference tile. So in this case, it would be 55 HBU. And inside this folder are a bunch of different, different zips. And each of the zips corresponds to one time point of acquisition 
and inside that zip are all of the channels that were acquired at that point in time. So of course you've got red, green, blue, you've also got um, near infrared alongside uh, other channels as well. And so if we take a look at what one of these folders looks like, this is 55HBU. Inside here, we have a bunch of zips, each is timestamped uh, according to the date of acquisition. And inside there are all of the different zips. And we can see some of them are quite large and each of them belongs to a different channel. Now, as we can see here, these raw images often had clouds because this is Victoria. So clouds are pretty much guaranteed. Uh, and also some of them were just partially acquired because the satellite doesn't always orbit uh, perfectly over that tile. And so we just get these sort of little triangles of the image acquired. And of course, if we wanna perform analysis on these images, that's gonna have to go away. And so the next step of the pipeline was image interpolation that was performed to both remove the clouds and also to get rid of these partially acquired tiles. Um, once the interpolation was complete, the, uh, this was passed to a CNN for classification. And finally, we got our, our labeled images out, um, ready for stitching with the Monash Veg map. And so of course, the, the first step of making this workflow more interactive was giving the researchers a way to open these raw images uh, and be able to browse through time and see what was going on. And as I mentioned before, the way to do that with Napari is to provide a reader plugin. Um, but what does it look like to be a reader for Napari? Essentially, if you have a function that can take a path and bring what's at that path into memory as an array-like data structure, then you can tell Napari about it using a hook implementation. And so this function here is the Napari get reader function is decorated with Napari hook implementation. And it's kind of just saying, hey, if you give me a string path, and if that path end was NumPy, then I'm going to return you the function that can take that path and give you the array back. Um, and so we built a reader for these raw images in Napari. And of course, the, the key issue was that these images are all stored in zips, and so they need to be extracted before display. But if we just extract the whole zip, not only is that going to give us a bunch of data that we may not even be looking at, but it's going to quickly blow up uh, the memory being used as well. And so the bread and butter of our data reader um, was this task delayed function, which takes a zip file name and then a path to a TIFF inside that zip and just extracts that one uh, TIFF file and returns that image as an array. And so let's see what that looks like in action. So here we've got the 55HBU fi uh, fi folder of TIFFs again. We've got Napari Sentinel zip, which is the package that provides the reader plugin. And we're able to just drag that folder in. And pretty quickly, we can see all of the different channels opened up. And the quick look JPEG, which is a thousand by a thousand image, is the only one that's visible. And as we scroll through, we can see all of the cloudy days. Um, and if we zoom in, of course, we don't have the same resolution as we would if we were to load full layers. Now we can load the full layers just by making them visible. But of course, because we're extracting 250 odd megabytes out of the zips, it takes a while to load them. Uh, but we do eventually get that um, nice, clear, high resolution, uh, 11,000 by 11,000 pixel loaded into memory. Um, and so this is good, but it's not perfect because of the time that it takes to load those full resolution layers. And also this approach wouldn't work for the interpolated data at all, as I'm about to go into now. Uh, so if we want to display some uh, slices of data over time, then we want time to be the first axis in index order, because then if we just index into that first axis, we're able to grab one full slice. And then of course the Y and the X follow after. Unfortunately, though, that's not how the TIFF cube was stored in memory as a result of the interpolation. So the TIFF cube, if we were to index into that first axis, what we would actually get is a slice that looks like this. So we get one very thin row of pixels across all of the time points. But of course, we want to display the full slice. If we want to do that, then we have to scan through a bunch of these slices. And even though we're not viewing the whole cube, it would mean we have to load the whole cube into memory for scanning, which is not going to be possible because these interpolated images are about 170 gigabytes each. And so the first step of processing this data so that it would be easily viewable was storing the images in a chunked array format. And we used OMEZAR in our case. Um, 
And that meant that we had much better access times for display and still pretty reasonable access times for analysis. Um, the second step was making these images multi-scale so that when you do make the layer visible, if you're zoomed out, you just get that lower resolution um, and you load the higher resolutions as you zoom in. And Napari already supports multi-scale images. Uh, so what we provided to the researchers was a command line utility to convert the TIFF cube into this OMESR format. Um, and we chose OMESR format, which was actually built for microscopy images because it supported many of the features that we needed, including multi-scale images, uh, color mapping contrast limits metadata, and it already had an Apari reader that we could use. Uh, so we didn't have to build out any additional infrastructure for that. And the final sort of image artifact that's produced as a result of this workflow are the labels. And this is an example of what the labels might look like for a given tile. And the full scale image is about 480 megabytes. Um, so it's small compared to the rest of the data, but it's still annoying to load into memory uh, every time you want to you know, check out what's going on with the labels. And of course, short of just memorizing this legend, uh, there was no easy way to reference from the color of a pixel back to what its actual land cover classification was. Um, now, Napari supports label properties, as we'll see in a moment, as well as specifying custom colors. So we could bring those colors from the website into Napari. And we also multi-scaled the labels uh, and transformed them into a MISA format as well. And so we've talked a little bit about how to bring all of this data into Napari. And so now we're going to pray that the Lords of Life demo are kind to us today, and we're going to do one of those. So I'm going to launch Napari, and it's bringing all of the raw data, interpolated data, and labels into the viewer. As we can see, we've got the raw layers in both RGB and NIR, the interpolated data, again, RGB and NIR, and then we've also got the labels, which are not visible at the moment. Uh, so if you try and scroll through this image, we can see that it's relatively smooth. Uh, of course, it's not instant because we have to access new chunks uh, on the hard drive. This is reading from an external hard drive as well, but it's pretty good. And if we scroll over time, we can see the bushfire season, unfortunately, drying up this area of Victoria pretty dramatically. Um, and if we go back to this first time point, we can see these sort of hazy regions. Uh, and those are clouds that were not correctly interpolated. And with the raw data in the viewer, we can easily determine why that is. It's because the first few days were either fully cloudy, as you can see there, or they were actually just partially imaged. Uh, so given the data that we had to work with for this first interpolated day, uh, we've actually done, not we, the researchers have actually done pretty well uh, to get a nice clean image out. Uh, and so then, of course, the next step of the uh, process is looking at the labels. And so we can make the labels visible and that overlays onto the um, original image. We can change the opacity just to look at um, you know, the data underneath really easily if we want to. And then if we hover over a particular label, we can see its classification down in the bottom left here. So this is water. Uh, so that's good. That's a tick. Uh, this is native woody cover. The pink areas are urban. And so we don't need to reference anything else. We can just uh, look at the bottom left-hand corner whenever we're having over a pixel and immediately get its classification, uh, which is pretty cool. And alongside just bringing all of this data into Napari, we also built out some more interactive widgets. So a, a common use case for uh, analyzing what's going on with your classification and whether there are sources for classification errors is looking at the NDVI uh, index, so the uh, normalized difference vegetation index of your layers. And we've built an interactive widget to do that. So you can select your red layer, you can select your NIR layer. And then when you run it, we can see that the NDVI layer is uh, produced, added to the viewer, and computed lazily as we scroll through. Uh, and it's certainly supporting our own you know, visual uh, realization that Victoria is drying up over the year, but it does actually uh, start to recover towards the end of the year, which is nice. Uh, and of course, this is also uh, a dask array. In fact, all of the layers in here are dask arrays, but let's just have a look at that. And the final layer would be our NDVI layer, uh, and it is also uh, a dask backed array. So we're doing all of this lazy computation, which is very nice. 
And then the other interactive widget I wanted to show you was one that actually computes the NDVI profiles of a pixel over time. Uh, and so the researchers were uh, per performing classification and just returning one pixel classification across all of the time points. And seeing the NDVI profiles of a pixel over time was really handy for them to determine whether the classification was accurate and whether that pixel is behaving the way you would expect such land cover to behave. Uh, so if we, we again select the red NNIR layers, and if we kick this off, we've got a matplotlib canvas down the bottom. We can see we've got the matplotlib toolbar as well. And we've also had a points layer added to our um, viewer. And we're in add points mode. So if we add a point, Napari is going to go away and compute the NDVI profile of that pixel over time. Remember, this is doing out of order array access, but because we're chunked, uh, we still get pretty decent performance here. And eventually, once the computation for this coordinate is done, we'll see a line added onto our canvas corresponding to the NDVI profile of that pixel in time. And there we are. We can add more points if we wish to. And we can actually see again, just this, this trend of Victoria getting drier and then sort of slowly recovering towards the end of the year. When we add a new line, uh, it gets colored with the color, the point gets colored with the color of the line. So it's a bit easier to uh, see what's going on. And if we select a point and move it elsewhere, let's say we move it over here, then Napari goes away and recomputes uh, the profile for that point. And if we give it a bit of time, we'll see this, uh, this line update on the plot as well. And so as we can see, um, it's updated on the plot. And in fact, it's, it's curious to look at because as we see this native woody cover is actually changing much less over time than what we saw the grassland and the farming areas change. Um, so this is fairly interactive. It's certainly near real time, if not exactly real time. Um, and it's overall a pretty interactive system compared to what the researchers were working with uh, at the time. But of course, there are some limitations uh, to what we've shown here today. And the first limitation is the processing time. Uh, so for one tile to go from that interpolated TIFF cube to the multi-scale OMEZAR format takes about 40 hours on my machine with 16 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, and so that's clearly a huge limitation. Now, when we were doing this work, Ryan Abernathy had recently released ReChunker, which was based on computing an optimal chunking scheme from a source chunk to target chunks. Uh, and it was using this intermediate step to try and avoid out of order array operations. But when we tried incorporating this for our own rechunking, which was just being done manually, um, our initial estimates put processing time for rechunker about 16% slower uh, than our manual rechunking. So that, that was pretty surprising for us. And if anyone has experience with rechunker or with this type of processing, we'd love to hear from you and improve that. Um, the other limitation is at the time, as I mentioned, the tiles were being acquired semi-manually using an SSH connection to PEPS, which is the French platform offering access to the Sentinel images. And this was a huge bottleneck for our researchers and it was a huge bottleneck for us as well in getting additional sample data. Uh, now, a few weeks ago, a few days ago, actually, I was um, pointed to this blog post by Pavithra Esvaramurthy, and he discusses a potential solution to this problem presented by Gabe Joseph in the way of a library called StackStack, which turns a stack collection into a lazy dask backed X-ray and brings that into memory. Of course, haven't had a chance to work with that, but it seems very promising. Uh, and if anyone does have any experience with it, again, we'd love to chat. So in conclusion, for our purposes, we found that chunking was definitely worth it in providing reasonable display uh, access, but also good access in out of order uh, for analysis. And as we've seen, RAM can be enough. We brought over 200 gigabytes of data into relatively smooth browsing uh, just before in that live demo. And that's just using my machine, which is 16 gigabytes of RAM, which is respectable, but not extreme. Um, and what we also saw is that despite this being one of the simplest applications of Dask, we certainly weren't pushing Dask to its limits. We were just using the lazy arrays uh, and the delayed functions just to you know, avoid computation except when we need it. 
Dask was indispensable for this work. So the, there's basically no way that this could have been done without Dask. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the talk. I hope you found it interesting. And if there's any questions, I'll be on the slide. Thank you. Thanks, Dragon. That was a really fantastic talk. Uh, really, really interesting. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, so everybody, if you have any questions uh, for our first speaker, uh, please pop them in the chat. Um, we'll, we've got time for, for maybe uh, just one or two uh, and any that we don't get to uh, on video. There is a conference Slack. You've got the email with the invite um, yeah, sent out last night. So you can join that. We have a specific Slack channel uh, for the DAS Down Under workshops. Um, so you can, you can join that um, and keep the conversation going there after. Seeing a lot of, lot of uh, enthusiasm for your talk uh, in the chat, Dragon. It's been really, really good. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs>